Developers can structure their code in many different ways. Python allows for object-oriented procedural and functional programming models, or as they are often called, paradigms. In this video, I'll focus on procedural programming, which is like writing step-by-step -step instructions that a program executes. It's an important stepping stone to object-oriented programming. Therefore, as a new developer, it's important to learn more about it. The main purpose of a programming model is to structure your code. That structure makes it easier to update the code and create new functionality within the code. But there's no one perfect model that's a solution to coding structures. And sometimes a combination of approaches works best. Procedural programming structures code into procedures, sometimes called subroutines or functional sections of code. Because of this approach, the code is made up of logical steps to complete a specific task. For example, adding two numbers to return their sum. I can add together the numbers 5 and 10 with a short piece of code. Now I want to add together the numbers 8 and 4. However, the code I wrote was specifically to add 5 and 10. For my new numbers, I must create another similar piece of code to do the calculation. That would not be a very efficient way to code. Instead, I change the code into a function that will accept two numbers as arguments and return the sum. With this function, I don't declare the actual numbers as variables. Instead, I use the parameters a and b. Less code is needed. But something more important has happened. I now have the function called sum, which can be reused as many times as I like with many different sets of numbers. In programming, there is a principle called dry, don't repeat yourself. And it's all about reducing duplication in code. The original code I wrote to add two numbers together to return their sum is a good example of what not to do because I had to write the code twice to accommodate the second set of numbers. A guideline to keep in mind is to create functions that can be reused throughout your application. Let's examine another example. This time for calculating the total of a bill and adding tax to it. The code will be presented in four sections to help you focus on what each procedure does. First, the build total function accepts a build as a parameter and loops through it to calculate the total build and return its total. The calculate tax function accepts two parameters, the percentage and the bill total. Then it returns the total amount of tax to be added to the bill, which is also rounded off to two decimal places. The food bill, which contains its items, represents a customer's bill which is static but could also be changed to an input to accept data from the user to dynamically create a bill. The last few sections will call the two functions to calculate the bill and tax, and then print each out along with the overall total. Could you identify the subroutines or functional sections of the code? And did you note how these sections reuse one another? Now let's put the four subroutines together to examine the four ways in which the footprint of the code is reduced by procedural programming. It's best to inspect the code by starting at the end. Tax total reuses food total. Food total reuses bill total and food bill. Calculate tax reuses bill total. And bill total reuses food bill. In summary, the advantages of the procedural paradigm are, it's easy for beginners to learn and get started. Procedures can be reused by other parts of the code. Code is easy to understand because each procedure is broken into specific tasks. Procedural programming does have some disadvantages, including it can be harder to maintain and extend. In some cases, it doesn't relate well to real world objects. Data is exposed throughout the whole program. Procedural programming has both its advantages and disadvantages. As you learn more as a new developer, you will be better able to decide if it's the best approach to a specific piece of coding or not. In this video, you'll learn about algorithms. An algorithm is a series of steps to complete a given task or solve a problem. On a day-to-day -day basis, you use algorithms all the time to complete tasks. One such example is following a recipe to make an egg omelette. First, you have the list of ingredients to use in your omelette. This can be called your input. Next is the method or the instructions to follow step by step to create your dish. Finally, you complete the omelette, your output. The steps to make the omelette are the same every time. 
An algorithm in programming works in a similar way. In programming, algorithms are used to solve a multitude of problems that range from simple to very complex. The key to understanding and creating an algorithm is to break the problem into smaller parts, just like the egg omelet recipe. That way, you build up the steps to complete the algorithm that will resolve the overall problem. Now, let's explore a practical application of algorithms in coding. I'm going to demonstrate a particular algorithm that checks if a word is a palindrome. A palindrome is a word that can be spelled the same both backwards and forwards. For example, the word race car is a palindrome because I can spell it forward as R-A-C-E-C-A-R -E and backwards it's still the same, R-A-C-E-C-A-R. -E to be able to check if a word is a palindrome, I need to use an algorithm. As mentioned earlier, an algorithm is a series of steps to solve a problem. Let me break down the problem. I know the string in my example race car has an index and I need to check if the index at the front of the string is equal to the index at the end of the string. In this way, I can compare the two values at the indexes. So I print str0 because that's the first index. And I also print str6 because that's the last index. I can just count that up to double check. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then I click on run. The output is the two values I need to compare, both of which are the letter R, at the beginning and at the end of race car. Now I'm going to break down our problem into smaller steps. First, I need to check if the value of index 0 is equal to the value of the last index 6, which in this case is R. Then I need to check that the next or second character, which is index 1, is equal to the second last character, which is index 5. Finally, I need to check if character 2 is equal to character 4. What I need to do is to check if these conditions are true or false. So let's check how I can write this out in some code. I begin by creating a function def is palindrome, and I know that it will accept a single parameter called string, which I've entered. Now I want to get the starting index as well as the end index. I put the start index into a variable that equals zero. Every string will always start at the index zero, and then the end index is going to be the length of the string. So I enter end index equals len function str and then minus one. This is because a string always starts at zero, and I have to think about the last index. Next, what I want to do is iterate through the string itself and compare the starting index with the end index characters to validate that they are the same. To do this, I create a for loop by typing 4x in str, and I'll make the comparison within the for loop. I can check if the first index is equal to the last index, and since the two characters r and r are the same, it'll continue to be true. But it would be quicker for me to check if it's false because then I'll know straight away if it's not a palindrome. So I do an if statement and I use the string being passed in as the parameter. Then I use the start index to get the character. And then I check if it's not equal to the string within the end index. If this condition is met, it will return false, which confirms that it's not a palindrome. But if the condition is never met outside the for loop, then it returns true, which confirms that it's a palindrome. I've done all the checks across the starting index and the end index, and it returns back to the condition of true to confirm that it's a palindrome. Now I'm going to test the algorithm to verify that it works. I use a print statement. I call the isPalindrome function, and I pass in race car because I know that it's a palindrome. I click on run, and it returns the value of true. If I change race car to race cars, and I run it again, the condition of false is returned. This is an example of creating an algorithm in code to solve a problem. It has a series of steps that have to be followed to resolve the problem in code to give back the condition of, is the string a palindrome or not? Now you know how useful algorithms can be as a step-by-step -step way to solve a problem with coding. An algorithm can be used to solve problems, whether small or complex. Once the steps of an algorithm are created, they will then execute the same way each time the algorithm is used. As a developer, your main task will be to write code to suit business needs. That code will have to go through what's called refactoring. This means that you rewrite or rework the code to make it easier to manage or to run more efficiently. Refactoring is a standard part of the software development cycle. 
Making code easy to manage may be straightforward, but what about making it faster or making it perform better? To determine how to make code faster or perform better, you must be able to measure it. Code is measured by time and space. Time is measured by how long it takes, and space is about how much memory it uses. Big O notation has different complexities or categories ranging from horrible to excellent, and it's used to measure an algorithm's efficiency in terms of time and space. Let's explore the different kinds of time complexities. First, constant time. This is an algorithm that will always run under the same time and space, regardless of the size. Take a dictionary, for example. To get the value of an item, you need to have the key. The key is a direct pointer to the value and does not require any iterations to find it. It's considered constant. Second is a linear time algorithm. This will grow depending on the size of the input. For example, if I have an array of numbers with a range of 100, it will run very fast. But if it's increased to a million, it will take a lot longer to complete. The size in this case affects the running time of the code. Third, a logarithmic time algorithm refers to the running time of the input against the number of operations. I can take a linear approach to try to find a number out of 100. Let's say the number is 97. In a linear equation, it will take 96 iterations before it's found. This is because it must iterate through each item one by one until it finds the target value. Using a binary search, I can drastically cut down the iterations and find it under seven iterations. This is measured by logarithmic time. The binary search works by splitting the list into two parts each time to check if the target is less than or greater than one. Fourth, quadratic time refers to a linear operation of each value of the input data squared. This is often a nested list as in this for loop. This for loop is considered quadratic time as the outer loop will need to iterate in a linear way 10 times. But it also has to iterate the inner loop the same 10 times for each single outer loop. This means its total iterations are 10 times 10, which is 100. Fifth and last is exponential time, which is an algorithm that doubles with each iteration. The Fibonacci sequence is a prime example of this. Refactoring code can be a big task, but understanding algorithmic complexity and how it's calculated makes it easier to optimize code. Now that you know about constant, linear, logarithmic, quadratic, and exponential time, you are one step closer to your goal of being a developer. Perhaps you've heard of functional programming. It uses a different paradigm than other models such as object-oriented. It's particularly adept at processing large amounts of data at high speeds. This video will get you started with what functional programming is. Later in the lesson, you'll explore topics such as pure functions, recursion, reversing a string, and useful Python functions such as map and filter. Let's start by exploring the role of a function. Functions take some input, process it, and then produce some output. There are two types of functions, traditional and pure. Pure functions will always do the same thing and return the same result, no matter how many times they are called. There are several differences between traditional and pure. So let's list them. Traditional functions can access and modify variables on the global state, but pure functions cannot. Both traditional functions and pure functions can access variables in the local state. Traditional functions can change args, whereas pure functions cannot. And lastly, the output of traditional functions does not depend on inputs. However, the output of pure functions does depend on inputs. Functional programming, in essence, is a programming paradigm that utilizes functions for clean, consistent, and maintainable code. Compared to object-oriented programming, which we'll learn about later, functional programming differs by design. Functional programming does not change the data outside the scope of the function. This simply means that the function should avoid modifying the input data or arguments being passed. Instead, it should only return the completed result of the intended function being called. Functions are considered standalone or independent, and this aids the clean and elegant nature of the code. In fact, many of the strongly typed object-oriented languages have incorporated functional programming into their structure. In order to support functional programming, the language itself needs to allow functions to be passed as an argument and also return a function to its caller. 
In Python, functions are what is known as first-class citizens, which essentially means they have the same level of strings and numbers. They can be assigned to a variable, passed as an argument, or returned to its caller. Let's explore a few examples of functions available in Python. Take, for instance, the sorted function. The sorted function accepts a list of items and then returns that list in a sorted order. You can use a sorted function to list items in alphabetical order. By passing a list of coffees to the sorted function, the return sorts the list in alphabetical order. The great thing about functional programming is that the logic behind certain tasks is already built in for you. Functions are reusable and thus save a lot of development time. But did you know that you can also create your own functions specific to your own requirements? Let's look at a simple example. Imagine you want to spell the names of the coffees backwards. This might not be entirely useful, but it's a good showcase of functional. You can create your own simple reverse function to do this. Define the function. Let's call it reverse and assign the variable str to it. Now return the value of str with a slice function. You'll learn more about the slice function later in the lesson. Then assign a variable to get the result to the map function. The map function accepts as its first argument the reverse function and then the iterable, coffees. It will then automatically handle the iterations to go through each coffee and apply the reverse function to it. In this video, you have learned what functional programming is and you were introduced to examples of built-in functions in Python. A good coder will try to keep code clean, make it easier to debug, and ensure it's extendable. The great thing is that pure functions can help you do all that. In this video, you'll learn what pure functions are and how you can use them in functional programming. It's important to understand that there is a clear difference between traditional and pure functions. A pure function is a function that does not change or have any effect on a variable, data, list, or set beyond its own scope. For example, if you have a list with a global scope, a pure function cannot add something to that list or alter it in any way. Let's explore an example function and then determine if it is a pure function or not. This code includes a list on the global scale and a function called add to a single parameter called item. The value of item is then set to four. The output is one, two, three, four. What do you think? Is this a pure function? No, it's not a pure function as it changes the global list by appending the item which is passed as an argument. In order to change it to a pure function, you need to think how to extend the function to accept a list as an argument. Add the item to the list without modifying the original list and how to return a new list with a newly added item. The solution is to create a new list and copy or clone the data from the original list. Let's revisit the code to make some changes. This time, you make a copy of the original list. The new item is added to the new list. Then the new list is returned to the caller. Now that you have a better idea of what a pure function is, let's review a few benefits of pure functions. Firstly, with pure functions, you always know what the outcome will be. Pure functions are consistent snippets of code that do exactly what they are intended to do. Thirdly, pure functions include the ability to cache since you know the return is always going to be the same. Lastly, pure functions lend themselves well to a multi-threaded program. In multi-threaded programs, more than one process could run concurrently, which creates many threads of data. Pure functions will help prevent changes on the global scope, ensuring data stays reliable. Now I think it's time to offer you a step-by-step -step demonstration in VS Code of how to alter a normal function to a pure function. Pure functions are especially useful because they are easier to read, better to debug, and more consistent. I'll now take you through a simple example to demonstrate how to create a pure function. I'll start by creating a function that does not behave like a pure function and then I'll tweak it until it's a pure function. First, I create a list called my list, and inside it, I add three numbers, one, two, and three. Then I add a simple function called add to list, which takes a single variable called item. This function will return my list and append the new item that is being passed through. Below that, I call the function add to list and assign the value of four to the variable item. Finally, 
I add a print statement of my list so that I can focus on the output in the console. I click on the run button and the numbers one, two, three, and four are printed out. This means that my list now contains the inserted number four as well because the function appended it to the existing list. What do you think? Is this a pure function? No, it's not because the data has been manipulated at the global scope from inside the scope of the function. Let's try to turn it into a pure function. The first thing I'm going to change is how the function is being called. I want to pass in a new argument. I type new list equals add to list. I keep the value of four, and I'll also print out the new list below the first print statement to compare the output. Now let's make some modifications to the function itself. I add a simple append to my list, which is going to take in the item variable. I type my list dot append and item in parentheses. Then I want to return back the list. I type return my list. Now I click on run and the output in the console indicates that both my list and new list include the values of one to four. It's clear that the function is still not a pure function. Why? because even though it's returning a new variable, it still has a reference to the my list variable. Let's try something else to turn it into a pure function. This time, I'll accept a parameter called LST for the variable item. I type LST comma in front of item in the parentheses. I also change the append statement to LST dot append item. And I also change the return action to return LST. Finally, I change the call action by passing in my list comma inside the parentheses before the value of four. Let's run that. And once again, both lists contain the values of one to four. The reason for this is that the function is still using the list as an argument and it's still being updated from within the function. So ultimately, in order to create a pure function, the problem that I have to solve is how to create a new list. And then I need to solve how to get all the values from the list that's being passed through and then return the new list back to the calling action. Let's give it another try. This time I create a new list by creating a copy. In the function, I type the name of the new list nl equals lst dot copy and a set of parentheses. Now, instead of putting the passed values into the lst, I'll put it into the copy. So I type nl.append, and then I also change the return action to return nl. I clear the console screen so that I can focus on the output and click on run. And finally, I get two different results. My list is printed with the values one, two, and three, but the second print statement for new list includes the values of one to four. This function is now a pure function because it adds a value to a list, but it doesn't manipulate the original list outside the function. In this demonstration, you've learned what a pure function is and what you need to do to change a function that's affecting a list on the global scope to a pure function that does not interfere with the original list. It's likely that you'll use pure functions regularly in your programming career because pure functions will keep your code cleaner, easier to debug, and easier to extend. In programming, recursion is used for solving problems that can be broken down into smaller repetitive problems. It's especially good for working on things that have many possible branches and are too complex for an iterative approach. One good example of this would be searching through a file system. So what is recursion? Recursion is essentially a function that calls itself. Recursion creates a pattern of repeating itself over and over and over. So what does that mean from a coding perspective? In this example, a function accepts a single argument and inside the function, it has some logic to deal with the problem it's trying to solve. The key part is the return. In the code, the return statement is returning the same function. Recursion is quite similar to a for loop. It will iterate, or in the case of a recursive function, call itself multiple times. But a warning, when you create a recursive function, you must always consider the result. If you don't, it will spin into an infinite loop and suck up all the memory until the program eventually crashes or gets terminated. Let's compare how to use a looping and a recursive solution to find the factorial of a number that can be solved. Let's start with the looping solution. The looping function accepts a single integer called n as an argument, 
and first checks if the number is less than zero. If it is, it returns zero as you can't have a factorial negative number. The else condition sets the factorial to one and then loops through the range of the argument, which is five in this case. The loop will calculate one times two times three times four times five, which will give the answer as 120, the factor of five. Now let's explore the recursive solution to the same problem. The recursive function is simpler than more compact. The main reason for this is that you no longer need the for loop to do the iteration of the n argument. The first line of the function verifies that the number is one and returns one if true. The else condition multiplies the argument n by calling the find factorial recursive function and passing in n minus one. Recursion can be difficult to understand, by way of explanation, let's demonstrate exactly what happened as the function calls itself. The function is being called over and over, and the part that changes is the value being passed into the function each time. The argument of n, or 5 in this case, is decreased by 1 each time until it finally is 1. This stops the function from being called again and exits out of the recursive process. So how exactly did this code get the result of 120? This is provided by the return statement. It keeps a reference to the incremented value, and this is the final return after it has been completed. Right, it's time to review the advantages and disadvantages of recursion. First, the advantages are, recursive code can make your code neater and less bulky. Complex tasks can be broken down into easier to read subproblems. Generation of sequences can be easier to understand than nested loops but there are disadvantages. It can be harder to follow the logic in recursive code. In terms of memory, they are expensive and sometimes inefficient. It can also be difficult to debug and step through the code. You should now be able to explain what recursion is and how it can be used to solve problems. I believe you'll benefit from using recursions in your code in the future. One of the basic ways to test a Python developer's problem solving skills is by asking them how they would reverse a string. Knowing how to do this is very useful in the production environment. Some programming languages have a built-in function to reverse a string. Python doesn't have such a function, but fortunately, due to the language's flexibility, there are several ways to do this. In this video, I will show you two ways to reverse a string in Python. First, I'll demonstrate how to do this with the slice function. To start off, I create a file called stringreversal.py. The format or syntax of a slice function is that it always starts with the name of a string, open square bracket, the start parameter, colon, the stop parameter, another colon, and then the step parameter, followed by a close square bracket. I'll add a hash symbol in front of this line to indicate that it is a note. This is called the extended slice syntax. The start and stop parameters are the indices between which the function manipulates the string. The step parameter is the hops or jumps the function makes while it traverses a given string. I will now first define a string, then manipulate the string with the slice function, and finally print the string. I'll call the string trial and assign the word reversal as its value by typing trial equal sign and the word reversal between double quotes. To manipulate the string, I create a new string called new trial. Now, I assign a value to new trial with the slice function. I type an equal sign, trial, and open square bracket. To instruct Python to use the entire string, I leave the value of the start and stop parameters empty. I simply type two colons and then add the value of the step parameter as the number minus one, followed by a closed square bracket. The negative value of the step parameter indicates that the string needs to be traversed from the right, one index position at a time, instead of the conventional method of starting from the left. Finally, I print the manipulated string to test if it works. I type print, and between parentheses, I add the string name new trial. I click on run. Great! In the terminal, the string has successfully been reversed. In summary, the entire string is traversed from right to left, one index position at a time. This new sliced object is then copied to another string, which is then rearranged and printed. It should be noted that you can use the slice function to manipulate the same variable. I only used a second variable in this example for clarity. The slice function is the simplest way to reverse a string. 
I will now demonstrate another way you can use the slice function to reverse a string, this time using recursion. I start by creating a new file and saving it as stringreversal2.py. Next, I define a function and pass a string variable to it, namely str. I type def and the function name string reverse and str between parentheses followed by a colon. This function will act as a conditional if statement. I type if len open parenthesis str close parenthesis two equal signs the number is zero followed by a colon. On the next line, I'll return the value of str. Now let's add the else statement. The else statement will recursively call the slice function, but with a modified string every time. On the next line, I add else and a colon. Then on the next line, I type return string reverse str. But before I close the parentheses, I add a slice function by typing open square bracket, the number one and a colon followed by the closed square bracket. This time, the string is traversed from the front, skipping the first character in every loop. And this first character skipped is appended to the remaining string. So I now add a plus sign, str, and the value zero in between brackets. Outside the function, I give str the value of reversal. Then I create a second variable that will store the value of the return string. I'll call this variable reverse and assign to it the value of the function. Finally, I add a print statement for the variable reverse. Let's run the code. Success! The string displays in reversed order in the terminal. Essentially, the function calls itself by passing a different string in each recursion and appending the element it has kept right after it. In this video, you learned two different methods to reverse a string in Python. The first by just using a slice function and the second by using a slice function with recursion. Let's say I want to generate a list using an existing list. The general process would involve applying some sort of operation to each element of the existing list and using those outputs to generate the new list. There are many ways you could do this in Python. In this video, you will learn how to process a list with the map and filter functions. My file contains a list called menu and it contains a list of various coffees. I want to filter this list for specific coffees. Say I want to print all coffees that start with the letter C. I will do this by creating a function through which I will pass the list to compare it to the letter C. Then I will demonstrate how to get the output first as a map and then as a filter. Before I start, let me talk you through the format of a map function, but keep in mind the filter function follows the same format. To create a map, I type map and then need to define its arguments. The map function accepts two arguments. The first argument is an actual function. In this case, it will be the function that I will use to match values based on a condition. The second argument is the articles that will be passed through that function. In this case, the coffees from my menu list. Now, let's create the function with the condition. I press enter twice to move the map function down. I type def and the name of the function, which is find coffee. I then add a single parameter coffee between the parentheses and a colon after the closed parenthesis. The coffee parameter I added will be the coffee from my list. I now need to check if the first character of the items in the list matches the letter C. To do this, I'll create an if statement by typing if coffee and pass in zero to set the action on the first letter of the coffee variable. I then type the equal sign twice followed by the letter C and a colon. I press enter and on the next line, I type return coffee if the statement is true. To use the map function, I'm going to assign it to a variable called map coffee. I follow that by entering an equal sign and the map. Now I can pass in the arguments for the map function. Remember, the first argument is the function itself. I enter the function name find coffee. It is important to note that I am not calling the function. I'm just passing it in like an argument. I add a comma, after find coffee, and then the second argument, the article, in this case, menu. Finally, I want to print out the value of map coffee so you can focus on the results in the terminal. I click on run and in the terminal, I receive a map object as output. The next step is to iterate through the map object. I type for x in map coffee, print out the value of x. I click on run again, 
and now I get the output as a map. In the terminal, a list appears with a lot of values that say none, except cappuccino and cortado. And that is because cappuccino and cortado are the two matches for the letter C in the function. The great thing about the map function is that I did not have to create a for loop to go through the list. The map function takes the function as an argument and passes the menu list values into the function one by one. So that handles the iteration for me, which makes it quite useful. Next, I'm going to demonstrate how to get the output with the filter function. To start, I'll comment out the section of the code related to the map function and clear my terminal. The filter function works much the same as the map function. I declare a variable called filter coffee and assign the filter function to it. Again, I add the two arguments, namely the find coffee function and menu. Then I print out the variable filter coffee. I click on run and receive a filter object as output. Now I will iterate through the filter object just like I did with the map object. I type for x in filter coffee, print out the value of x. I'll clear the terminal now and click run. This time, only cappuccino and cortado are returned. Why is that? Let me explain the difference between a map and a filter function. A map takes all objects in the list and allows you to apply a function to it. A filter also allows you to take in all objects in the list and runs through a function, but it creates a new list and only returns values where the evaluated function returns true. That is why there are no none values displayed in the output for the filter function. You now know how map and filter work in Python and should be able to also explain the difference between the two functions. Programming languages are built upon certain models to ensure that code behaves predictably. Python primarily follows what is known as an object-oriented paradigm or model. As you'll soon discover, object-oriented programming or OOP relies heavily on simplicity and reusability to improve workflow. By the end of this video, you'll be familiar with the object-oriented programming paradigm. You'll also be able to identify the four main concepts that define object-oriented programming. Programming paradigms are a strategy for reducing code complexity and determining the flow of execution. There are several different paradigms such as declarative, procedural, object-oriented, function, logic, event-driven, flow-driven, and more. These paradigms are not mutually exclusive. So programs and programming languages can opt for multiple paradigms. For example, Python is primarily object-oriented, but it's also procedural and functional. In simple terms, a paradigm can be defined as a style of writing or program. OOP is one of the most widely used paradigms today due to the growing popularity of languages that use it, such as Java, Python, C++, and more. But the OOP's ability to translate real-world problems into code is arguably the biggest factor in its success. OOP has high modularity, which makes code easier to understand, makes it reusable, adds layers of abstraction, and allows for code blocks to be moved between projects. To help you better understand OOP, I'll first clarify some of its key components, which are classes, objects, and methods. A class is a logical code block that contains attributes and behavior. In Python, a class is defined with a class keyword. The attributes can be variables and the behavior can be functions inside of it. You can create instances from these classes which are called objects. In other words, a class provides a blueprint for creating an object. In more practical terms, let's say you want to record the attributes of employees at Little Lemon such as their position and employment status. You could create a class called employee and conveniently bundle those attributes in one place. Next, let's discuss objects. As mentioned, an object is an instance of a class and you can create any number of them. The state of an object comprises its attributes and behavior and each one has a unique identifier to distinguish it from other instances. The attributes and behavior of the class are what define the state of the object. For example, you can create the object emp1 by calling the employee class. Once called, you can define the position and employment status attributes as shift, lead, and full time, respectively. In code, this would be written as emp1 equals employee, followed by shift, lead, and ft in parentheses. 
This is a case of instantiation or creating an instance of a class. Finally, there are methods, which are the functions defined inside a class that determine the behavior of an object instance. Let's say you want the employee object to output a string that states their position. You would first declare their function intro in the employee class and then call it on an object to get the output. Now that you know about classes, objects, and methods, let's explore the concepts that OOP hinges upon. The first one is inheritance, which is the creation of a new class by deriving from an existing one. The original is called the parent or superclass, while any derivatives are referred to as the subclass or child class. The next concept is called polymorphism. It's a word that means having many forms. In the context of Python, polymorphism means that a single function can act differently depending on the object that calls it. For example, the built-in plus operator works differently for different data types. In the case of integer data types, the built-in plus operator performs addition operations such as 3 plus 5 equals 8. On the other hand, in the case of string data types, the built-in plus operator performs a concatenation or combining two strings together. This ability of modifying functionality is called polymorphism. The third concept is encapsulation. Broadly, this means that Python can bind methods and variables from direct access by wrapping them within a single unit of scope, such as a class. Encapsulation helps prevent unwanted modifications, in effect, reducing the occurrence of errors in output. And finally, there is a concept of abstraction. This refers to the ability to hide implementation details to make data safer and more secure. Note that Python does not support abstraction directly and uses inheritance to achieve it. This is something that you'll explore in more detail later. There are some other important concepts in OOP, such as method overloading, method overriding, constructors, and more, which you'll learn about in more detail later. In this video, you became familiar with OOP paradigm and the four concepts that support it. Inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, and abstraction. See you next time. Classes have the ability to combine data and functionality, which is a very useful feature when you are coding. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain what classes, instances, and objects are in Python. You'll also be able to create a class, instantiate it, and access its variables and methods. You may have also heard of classes discussed in terms of attributes and behaviors. In general, Attributes refer to variables declared in a class, while behaviors are associated with the methods in a class. Creating a class creates a new type of object, from which you can create instances. An important thing to keep in mind is that everything in Python is an object, or derived from the object class. To demonstrate how this all works, I'll create a class that I can then derive objects from. In a new VS Code file, I first type the keyword class, followed by the name my class, and a colon. I do need to take one more step so that Python doesn't throw an error, and that is to type the pass keyword on the next line. The pass keyword plays the role of a placeholder when nothing needs to be executed. In practice, this tells Python that I won't do anything with this class just yet. Next, let's create an object for this class. I create a variable called my class, and then assign the class to it by typing equals my class, followed by parentheses. If I run this code, the output shows that it has executed without errors. However, just to check that it's working as expected, let's add a print statement to the class. So that would be print followed by the string hello in parentheses. When I run the code again, the word hello appears in the output. Let me clear the terminal before continuing. You may have noticed that I used the same name for both the class and its object, but the object name can really be anything. For example, if I change the object name to myc and run the code once more, it will execute the same as before. Everything I've typed is part of the instantiation process in Python, which involves three key steps. One, class definition. Two, creating a new instance. And three, initializing the new instance. Since everything in Python is an object, it makes sense to follow naming conventions to make things less confusing later. In this case, I have my class for the class object and myc for the instance object. 
There is a third type of object called the method object, which you can use to call a method whenever it's needed. Classes mainly perform two kinds of operations, attribute references and instantiation. I've already written an example of the latter, so let's try building an attribute reference this time. First, I create a variable a for the class object and assign it a value of five. To print this variable, I first need to refer to the class. So under the instance object, I type print and then my class dot a. When I run the code, it returns five in the output. To confirm that the class reference is necessary, I delete my class from the print statement and run the code again, and Python throws an error. So I'll correct the code and put my class back in. Let me clear the terminal quickly before continuing. So you know what happens if you reference a class object, but what if you reference an instance object? Let's find out by typing a print statement for myc.a and then running it. In the output, I get five, which shows that attribute reference still works with instance objects. Finally, let's finish up by creating a method inside this class. I'll use the def keyword and follow it with hello, a pair of parentheses and a colon. On the next line, I type a print statement for the string hello world. I'll also delete the first print statement to avoid confusion. To call this method, I add a new print statement at the end of the document for myc.hello, which uses the instance object. This should work just as I successfully called a variable through an instance object, right? Running the code results in an error, so methods are not quite as simple. Fortunately, I can resolve this by adding the keyword self within the parentheses of the method as defined in the class. Running the code again produces the words hello world in the output. You'll also find the word none printed below, as there is no return value from the given function. That's a brief demonstration of classes, instances, and objects. I created a class, then I was able to instantiate it and access its variables and methods. Code reusability is the use of existing code to build new software. Reusability is a core programming concept. By the end of this video, you'll not only be able to create a class and instantiate it with variables and methods, but you'll also discover how referencing the same variables and methods in separate instances can produce different outcomes, meaning that the code is reusable. I'll start by creating a new file called recipes.py, where I'll also create a class called recipe. Before continuing, let's also explore two special methods in Python. The first one is the new method, which is responsible for creating and returning a new empty object. To write it, I start with the def keyword, followed by double underscore new. It then appears as a suggestion, so I click on it to fill out the rest. The CLS here is not a keyword, but rather a convention. It acts as a placeholder for passing the class as its first argument, which will be used for creating the new empty object. The second method is the init method, which is similar to what is known as a constructor in some other programming languages. It takes the object created using the new method, along with other arguments, to initialize the new object being created. I write it with the def double underscore init, and then choose the first suggestion that pops up. The init method takes the new object as its first argument. The self keyword here is another convention. It has no function itself, but serves as a placeholder for self-reference by the instance object. So let's delete the two example methods and then write some code that demonstrates how to use the state of the object to your advantage. I begin with an init method, which I then use to initialize a few values. I do this for the value dish by typing self.dish equals dish. I then do the same for the values items and time. Before moving forward, I want to check that the arguments in the initializer will match those of my instances. To do so, I add dish, items, and time after self. Imagine a real world scenario where a restaurant chef wants information about the recipes they have been using. So let's write a class that will help them with that. I have the variables dish, items, and time in which items will hold the recipe ingredients. I now write a function to produce a string out of this information. I type def contents and then self in parentheses. On the next line, I write a print statement for the string the plus 
self.dish plus has plus self.items plus and takes plus self.time plus min to prepare. Here we'll use the backslash character to force a new line and continue the string on the following line. For this to print correctly, I need to convert the self.items and self.time references to strings by appending str at the beginning and encasing each reference in parentheses. Now that I have a class set up, let's use it to create a pizza instance. I write this as pizza equals recipe, opening parenthesis, the string pizza, comma, opening square bracket, cheese, comma, bread, comma, tomato, closing square bracket, comma, and 45 to represent the time followed by the closing parenthesis. I also want a pasta object. So let's copy and paste the code for the pizza object and change the object name to pasta, the ingredients to penne and sauce, and the preparation time to 55. Now that I have a class and two instances, let's see if I can access the instance attributes and methods. I write two print statements for pizza.items and pasta.items. When I run the code, I find that despite passing the same function and variable items, the two instances produce different contents. So next, let's try printing the instance method contents over pizza. Before we move forward, let's clear the terminal so we can more clearly see what the output will be. I type another print statement for pizza.contents and empty parentheses. I run the code once more, and the output uses the class method to print a line stating, the pizza has cheese, tomato, and bread, and takes 45 minutes to prepare. That's a demonstration of creating a class and instantiating it with variables and methods, then referencing the same variables and methods in separate instances to yield different outcomes. Let's try to solve a problem that may occur for managers at a restaurant. Because the managers are busy running the restaurant, they have limited time to deal with the needs of employees. The current system for paying wages requires managers to update each other every time an employee requests payment. Because this is cumbersome, they would like to implement an automated approach. So what can be done? Fortunately, there's a way to reduce the number of steps using instances. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain what instance variables and methods are. You'll also know how to use them to change the state of an instance object. So let's write some code to help those busy restaurant managers. Let's start a new file called paymentinfo.py. In this file, I'll create the class payslips and initialize three variables in it called name, pay status, and amount. I start by typing class payslips, and then on the next line, I call an init function with def double underscore init, and then select the triggered suggestion. For the variables, I type each one in the format self.variable equals variable. Next, I'll create two functions, one to display the status of the payment and another to update the status. The first function is written as def pay with self in parentheses, followed by self.payment equals yes on the next line. The second function is def status and contains an if else statement. If self dot payment double equals yes, return self dot name plus is paid plus self dot amount with str appended to the beginning. The second part of the statement is else return self dot name plus is not paid yet. Finally, let's create instances of this class for the employees. I'll call them Nathan and Roger. I type the first instance Nathan equals payslips and in parentheses Nathan for name, no for payment and 1000 for amount. For Roger, I copy and paste this instance and set the values to Roger, no and 3000 respectively. I also need to make sure to pass these values inside the init method. So I type name, payment and amount after self. Now I'm ready to call the instance method status to check the status of the payments. I write a print statement for Nathan.status parentheses and for Roger.status parentheses. When I run the code, the output all appears on one line, which is not very presentable. 
I add a new line character between the items and the print statement, which is backslash n. This time, the output is much cleaner. The output states that neither Nathan nor Roger have been paid. But let's say that one manager decides to pay Nathan, so I'll use the pay function to update the status. Remember that the pay function is set up to update the value of the payment variable. I type nathan.pay parentheses and then copy and paste the last print statement. Above this line, I type another print statement with the string after payment. I run the code once more and it now tells me that Nathan was paid 1000, whereas Roger still has not been paid. That's a demonstration of instance methods in action. Now I'll describe the code to you in more detail. Now let's discuss what happened in that coding example in more detail. The two instance objects, which are Nathan and Roger, each have their own states. You may have noticed that when the instance method pay was called to change the state of Nathan, Roger was not affected. This is because the method inside the class is not affected. Rather, it provides a separate blueprint to each instance, which can then be updated for that instance only. In the coding example, I didn't print the variable values after calling the pay function, but if I did, it would show that the payment instance variable for Nathan changed from no to yes, while Roger remained no. Now let's imagine that this code is the basis for an online payment system. It would allow either manager to click on the paid button for an employee, which then update to that employee status. No more back and forth calls. In this video, you learned how to use instance variables and methods to change the state of an instance object without affecting any other instances. When instantiating objects from a class, you may find that the class is missing some properties that you use frequently. In that case, you could decide to make a new class that replicates the first one, but also adds a few more properties. It would be cumbersome to write everything from scratch, but thanks to inheritance, you don't have to. By the end of this video, you'll become familiar with inheritance in terms of child classes being derived from a parent class. Inheritance is a core concept in object-oriented programming generally, and in particular in Python, and it's a major part of code reusability. You may know that everything in Python is an object, but let's explore that idea more closely. It specifically means that every class in Python inherits from a built-in base class called objects, which is found in builtins.objects. In other words, a class declaration such as some class with empty parentheses implies some class with object as its argument. When speaking of class derivation, the originating class is known as the parent class, superclass, or base class. The class which inherits from it is the child class, subclass, or derived class. Any name pairing is acceptable, but the important thing to know is that the child class extends the attributes and behaviors of its parent class. This allows you to do two things. You can add new properties to the child class, and you can modify inherited properties in the child class without affecting the parent. So now let's explore an example of how this is done in Python. Here you have a parent class P, which holds the variable A with a value of seven. Then there is the empty child class C, in which class P is passed as an argument. And finally, a lowercase c represents an instance of child class capital C. If you write a print statement for c dot a and run the code, the output is seven. So even though c itself is empty, it still holds the attributes inherited from p. Keep in mind that any changes in the parent class will also affect any child classes. Now that you have an idea of how inheritance works, let's explore an example that demonstrates the flexibility it provides. I begin by creating a new file called employment.py, and my first step is to create a parent class called employees, where I'll define two variables for first and last names. I do this by typing class, employees, colon, and on a new line, def double underscore init to trigger and select the init method suggestion. For the first variable, I type self.name equals name on a new line, and for the second, I advance another line and type self.last equals last. I then add name and last to the init argument on line two after the word self. 
Next, I'll create two child classes that both extend the employee class. The first one I create is supervisors. And to call the employees class, I type class, supervisors, open parenthesis, employees, close parenthesis, and a colon. I then need to modify the init method of the supervisors class so that I can add another variable named password. Again, I trigger and select the init method, but this time it already includes the name and last variables. By calling the employees class, the super method has automatically been applied to access the variables there and initialize them within the supervisors class. I proceed with adding the third variable, password, inside of the init method. I then make it an instance variable with the line self.password equals password. Now I'll write another child class called chefs. Again, I extend the employees class by adding employees as a method inside of this class. I want this one to contain a new function called leave request. So I type def leave request and then self and days as the variables in parentheses. The purpose of the leave request function is to return a line that specifies the number of days requested. To write this, I type return the string may I take a leave for plus str open parenthesis the word days close parenthesis plus another string days. Now that I have all the classes in place, I'll create a few instances from these classes, one for a supervisor and two others for chefs. First, I type Adrian equals supervisors, followed by the values Adrian and A in parentheses. I can then copy and paste this instance two more times to serve as a template for the chef's instances. The first chef is Emily and will hold the values Emily and E while the second chef Juno has the values Juno and J. Finally, as an instance of the supervisors class, Adrian needs another value for the password variable, so I'll assign Apple here. Next, let's call the instance method over Emily and pass a value to it. She wants to request three days off, so I type print Emily dot leave request and the number three. I'm also going to add another print statement that will check the value of the instance variable over the supervisor Adrian. I type print adrian.password. The third print statement prints the value of Emily's name variable. Now I run the code and get the following outputs. The words, may I take leave for three days from the first print statement, the word apple from the second one, and the word Emily from the third print statement. Note that both the instance variables and methods inside the individual inherited classes are present along with the variables from the parent class. In this video, you've learned how inheritance in Python helps to make code reusable, organized, and less redundant. In this video, you'll learn about abstract classes and methods. If you have an abstract class, you can ensure the functionality of every class that is derived from it. For example, a vehicle could be an abstract class. You can't create a vehicle, but you can derive a car, a tractor, or a boat from a vehicle. The methods we put in the abstract class are guaranteed to be present in the derived class because they must be implemented. If a vehicle has a turn on engine method, then we are sure that any method calls to a derived class that is looking for turn on engine will find it. This could be for reasons of interoperability, consistency, and avoiding code duplication in general. In object-oriented programming, the abstract class is a type of class for which you cannot create an instance. Python also does not support abstraction directly, so you need to import a module just to define an abstract class. Furthermore, methods in an abstract class need to be defined before they can be implemented. With all these limitations, one might wonder why you would use abstract classes at all. One of their key advantages is the ability to hide the details of implementation without sacrificing functionality. Implementation in abstract classes can be done in two ways. One is that as base abstract classes lack implementation of their own, their methods must be implemented by the derived class. Another possibility is that the super function can be used, but that's a topic for another time. For now, let's focus on the module for defining an abstract class. You may not be familiar with modules right now, but they will be covered in more detail later. 
For now, it's okay just to follow along. The module is known as the Abstract Base Class, or ABC, and needs to be imported with some code. After that, you can create a class called some abstract class and pass in the ABC module so that it inherits that class. The next step is to import the abstract method decorator inside the same module. A decorator is a function that takes another function as its argument and gives a new function as its output. It's denoted by the at sign. You may not be familiar with decorators, but for now, it's enough to know that decorators are like helper functions that add functionality to an already existing function. Finally, here you'll define an abstract method which cannot be called on an object of this class. You will be able to call this method over objects of classes that inherit from this class. Similarly, we can define abstract methods with the help of what we call an abstract method decorator present inside the same module. Any given abstract class can consist of one or more abstract methods. However, a class that has abstract class as its parent cannot be instantiated unless you override all the abstract methods present in it first. With that in mind, imagine a scenario in which an employer wants to collect donations from employees for a charitable cause. With your newfound knowledge, let's write some code to make that possible. First, I import the ABC module and its abstract method. Then I create the employee abstract class that calls abstract method to define a method called donate. Note that there's no implementation for this method here. After that, I create the class donation, which derives from the abstract class. Note that this class also overrides the abstract method. I write an implementation for the donate function, which takes a user input stores it in variable A and returns it. Next, I create two employee instances called John and Peter and call the function over each of them. I also create a list amount to which the returned values will be appended. Finally, I have a print statement for amount, which will give the value of the total donations from both employees. In this video, you learned about abstract classes and methods and how to implement them in your code. Up to this point, you've explored class relationships that were relatively straightforward. But what happens when things get complex? How will you know which classes inherit from which? Fortunately, Method Resolution Order, or MRO, provides rules that can help make sense of that. By the end of this video, you'll know how to explain the basic rules of method order resolution and how they apply to inheritance classes. Explain the concept of code linearization with respect to multiple inheritance and deploy method order resolution functions in Python. You've likely encountered some examples of single inheritance where a child class only inherits from a single parent class. But it's important to know that Python has many types of inheritance. The categorization types are based on the number of parent and child classes, as well as the hierarchical order. Including simple inheritance, there are broadly four types of inheritance. The first type is called simple inheritance, which you've already dealt with. There is also multiple inheritance, which involves a child class inheriting from more than one parent. Next is multi-level inheritance, which is inheritance taking place on several levels. Then you have hierarchical inheritance, which concerns how several subclasses inherit from a common parent. And finally, you could say that there is a fifth type called hybrid inheritance, which mixes characteristics of the others. As these inheritance types demonstrate, inheritance becomes increasingly complex as the number of classes in a project grow and become more interdependent. So how do developers solve this issue? With the use of MRO. MRO determines the order in which a given method or attribute is passed through in a search of the hierarchy of classes for its resolution, or in other words, from where it belongs. The order of the resolution is called linearization of a class, and MRO defines the rules it follows. The default order in Python is bottom to top, and left to right when imagining the inheritance of these Python classes in a tree structure. Let's take the simplest example of single inheritance. The object is first searched in the class of that object, and then in its superclass. 
What about in an example where class Z is inheriting from two classes? Let's say Z is inheriting from classes X and Y. In this instance, the MRO will be Z, Y, and then X. In other words, the MRO works its way bottom to top and then from left to right. But things become much more complicated when more levels are added to the hierarchy. So developers rely on algorithms to build MROs. Old style classes used in-depth first search algorithm or DFS. From Python version three onwards, Python versions have moved to the new style of classes that rely on the C3 linearization algorithm. The implementation of the C3 linearization algorithm is complex and beyond the scope of this lesson. But for now, here's an overview of a few rules that it follows. The algorithm follows monotonicity, which broadly means that an inherited property cannot skip over direct parent classes. It also follows the inheritance graph of the class, and the superclass is visited only after visiting the methods of the local classes. This logic will make more sense later when you explore more complex class relationships in a future lesson. Next, let's take a moment to explore some methods of finding the MRO of a class. First, I'll begin with a demonstration of the MRO attribute or function. Let's take a multi-level inheritance example comprised of three classes, class A, class B, and class C. Class A is the parent class with B and C the respective child classes. In other words, B inherits from A and C inherits from B. When I print the return for calling the MRO function over class C, the output indeed confirms that this is the order that is followed. So why is this important? Well, imagine that class A has a variable num with a value of five, and then class B also has a num variable with a value of nine. Here, the MRO function tells you quickly that class C will inherit the nine value from class B. Finally, let's examine one more function, which is the help function. If I take the code from earlier and replace the MRO function in the print statement with a help function, it provides a much more detailed output with MRO information at the top. It also contains information about the data descriptors and types used inside the code. In this video, you received a brief introduction to method resolution order and how it affects inheritance in different scenarios. These are both very broad topics, but hopefully it helps you understand the complexity of code that is possible in Python.